Hello, fellow foodies. Thanks for tuning in to listen to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. On this episode, we're going to take a closer look at one of nature's most remarkable and inspiring animals with a long history of both commercial and sports fishing all over the Northern Atlantic and Pacific. Salmon are threatened by everything from deforestation to climate change to dams. If the salmon survive, then just maybe there's hope for the rest of the planet. Let me tell you a bit about our guest for the show. Mark Kolansky holds degrees in both theater and journalism. In addition to writing articles appearing in a wide variety of leading newspapers and magazines, he's also the award-winning author of 33 books across the genres of fiction, nonfiction, and children's literature. My first introduction to Mark's work was not long after college when one of my former professors recommended that I read a book about cod. At first I thought to myself, why would I want to read a book about fish? But as I dove in, I was so blown away by the story and learned so much about the history of fisheries across the world. And I've been reading Mark's books ever since. I'm a huge fan of his works. You may recognize titles like Salt, Milk, Paper, and more. And I'm just so excited to have him on Foodie Pharmacology today to tell us about his latest book entitled Salmon. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Mark. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I guess the the first question I have is, what brought you to write a book about salmon? Why salmon? Well, um, as you mentioned, I wrote a book about cod that came out uh, in 1997. And this was at a moment when the most famous fish stock in the world, the, the, the northern cod of uh, the Canadian Grand Banks uh, plummeted. And it was a huge shock to the world. And for the first time, people started thinking about fishery management and problems of overfishing. By people, I mean the general public, because way back in the 60s, I worked as a commercial fisherman, and it was all commercial fishermen talking about was this problem. And the general public was not aware of it. And then I suppose I'm partly responsible for the fact that they became really aware of it <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of have this idea that this is the big problem so that, you know, when I say I'm writing a book about salmon, they immediately start talking and asking me questions about the overfishing of salmon, which there isn't a lot of actually. And what I had noticed over the years since my cod book came out is that there are so many other problems troubling fisheries. There are problems with overfishing, but so many other things. But if, if you had a fishery where the only problem was overfishing, that, that would be wonderful. That would be so uh, <laughs> simple compared with what we have. And it seemed to me that the best way to illustrate this point was to write a book about salmon. Because salmon, uh, because they're an anadromous fish, because they live in both the freshwater and the ocean, uh, are hit with everything we do wrong, you know, from um, pollution to uh, deforestation to bad farming practices to um, damming rivers to uh, climate change to climate change to climate change. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, as, as you said, I mean, I, I, I think if we could actually solve all we have to do to solve the problems of salmon is solve the problems of the earth we can save the earth we can save salmon (laughs) they're completely tied together yeah well i think that was one thing that definitely hit me in in the early portion of your book is your description of of what it's like to be an andronous fish the fact that they do represent the health of the oceans and the health of these of terrestrial Land masses when they go up into these rivers. Can you, can it's you? It's not just the health of the river, but the, of the banks of the whole land environment that the rivers yeah. are in. That's right, and the forests that surround the rivers, and yeah. And I mean, this this speaks a bit to my ignorance around around fisheries, but I had no idea about the physical changes that salmon go through in this process. Can you can you walk us through that a bit? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the life story of salmon is one of the most incredible things in nature. It, it really is. And it's, um, so they're born 
they're born in the gravel in a riverbed and um, gradually uh, work their, their, their way up and eventually grow to the size of a herring and uh, get to the mouth of the river. Uh, this can take a year, more than a year. There's a lot of different species of salmon and the timing is different on different species. When they get to the mouth of the river, they go through remarkable transformations. First of all, they got there being these lovely sort of spotted striped animals that, that blended um, with the river beds so that they were hard for predators to see. And now they have to go out to the ocean and a bright spotted striped thing would not be hard to find in the ocean, but they, they turn silver. They completely change their skin and they turn silver. Wow. And they change their, their, their gills, their breathing apparatus to become uh, an animal that derives its oxygen from salt water rather than one that derives its oxygen from fresh water, which is completely different. I mean, if you took freshwater fish and threw them in the ocean, they die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but these, these fish make the transformation and they spend years uh, grow to 95% of their size in the ocean. Uh, fierce predators eat lots. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, there again, the exact point depends on which species, but you know, years later, they realize it's time to spawn, it's time to reproduce. And this, this becomes their, their unquestioned, unalterable mission. And the first thing they do is they find the river where they were born, which is now thousands of miles away. Wow. And it's, it's not completely clear to scientists how they do this. There's a lot of different theories about um, uh, solar navigation and um, smell. I don't think smell plays a big part until they get to the river. Then it becomes very important. Seven have a very keen sense of smell, but they can't smell their native river thousands of miles away. They, they may use electromagnetic forces. There are electromagnetic sensors in their lateral uh, stripes. So, uh, we're not really sure, but somehow, miraculously, they get to the river of their birth and they set off on this journey up the river to the exact spot where they were born. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. They, they know where this is. And uh, here's where it gets really extraordinary. So the, the first thing that happens is they, they, they change their skin once again, because a silver fish would be too obvious to predators in the river. Um, and they stop eating. They no longer, once the salmon returns to its river, it no longer eats any food. Oh, wow. That's an interesting proposition for sports fishermen who lure salmon with, with flies that are supposed <laughs> to be like food. And it's a huge mystery why the salmon even bother with these flies. Yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not eating. And th this has been shown countless times that caught salmon, fly fishermen have caught salmon who ate their flies and they open their stomach and there's no food in them. Um, wow. So is it is it some instinct? Do they just find the flies annoying? Like you wave something in front of a cat? Or, uh, <clears throat> we don't know. But what they're doing is they are living on the the fat and protein that they accumulated in their life in the ocean, mm. and they're spending a little bit of that every day in in this incredibly difficult journey. I mean, there are there there are places you can go. And, and you witness this, there are, there are underground windows in the Gaspé in Canada where you can watch them going upstream. There are other places also. I mean, they're, 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 they're gaining the river centimeters at a time, just putting their nose in with incredible strength against, you know, a river like the, the, the Gaspé or a lot of salmon rivers, huge, powerful currents going the other way. Mm. <laughs> and they, um, they, they, they slowly make it up, and in the process, they completely change their look. Uh, 
they become red, they get big humps on their back, uh, they get weird hooked noses, buck teeth. It depends on the species. Uh, sockeye are one of the, the ones that changes the most. But they, they change into these very weird things. And, and why would they do that when you consider that this is using a huge amount of energy? The red color they take on is forcing out the pigment from their flesh. So wow. that if there are salmon spawns, its flesh is white. Uh, all the pigment has been, been forced out. And they, uh, they, they, they do this. Why? Darwin wanted to know. <laughs> His yeah. discussion of this is in the Descent of Man. He's looking at Atlantic salmon doing this. And Darwin believed, rightly, that uh, nature doesn't do things without reason purpose for everything you do in nature. Nature never decides, you know, fish don't say, oh, I think I'm going to change my outfit. <laughs> There's got to be a reason for it. And it turns out the reason, and this is Darwin's most controversial idea, the reason is to appear sexy and appealing to female. Uh, <laughs> uh, Victorian men hated this idea that, and, and Darwin you know, look at this in a number of animals, beetles that grow antlers that they don't use for fighting, and all these different animals that go through these changes to uh, appeal to women. Um, <laughs> Torian men just didn't like that idea. <laughs> but it's it, it's true, you know, a sockeye salmon is it's like this guy, you know, who shows up in this ridiculous bright plaid suit. <laughs> He said, why are you dressed like that? And he says, oh, the girls really like it. <laughs> well, they do. They really do. Uh, because it's very competitive. Uh, the females dig nests in the river bottom called reds. And the men compete to be selected by the females uh, to deposit their milk in the, in, the, in the red where the female has deposited her eggs. Okay. And, and, and this is all about judgments and genetics you know looking at a fish that looks like it's going to have good genes mm -hmm. uh, so they'll have good offspring and after uh after they spawn after the females uh deposit the eggs and the males deposit the um uh the milk the sperm and and you know this isn't a this isn't a good romantic story i've ever my job <laughs> Graduating class in high school, the, 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 the kid who's the valedictorian gave this whole speech about how we should be like salmon. She didn't really understand what salmon are like, you know. And they're, <laughs> they're not, they have no loyalty, no monogamy. The females will take out as many males as they can get. Males, <laughs> males will work as many nests as they, as they can get allowed on. Um, and after that is done, they have just spent every last ounce of energy they have and they roll over and die. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something incredibly poetic about it. They've done their job, they've reproduced, and now they die. Um, oh, like, so the successful, yeah, go on to propagate the next generation. <laughs> some, some Atlantic salmon survive, uh, and some steelhead survive. Uh, but, but most salmon die after they spawn. Uh, so much so that bears, you know, bears hang out in the spawning river because there's all these dead salmon floating to the floating to the surface, and they just scoop them up. Big meal. Dinner time, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, when you think about so, which is another uh, reason why salmon are important. This 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 whole process of dying in the river, and um, is replenishing the river. Not only the dead fish that that certain mammals pick up, but then the the, the, the fish that degenerate and their nutrients go back into the river and they, they, mm. they feed uh, the other fish and other animals and including insect life that, that live in, in the river. So if you didn't have the salmon going in the river and dying, the whole river would die out. Wow. It's really intricate relationships between all these different species. That's, that's and, nature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned there are many different species of salmon, I, I noted in your book you mentioned there are two genera. Um, how many how many species of edible salmon or, or species that, that humans eat are there? 
Well, uh, in the Atlantic genus, which is Salmo, mm -hmm. there's only one Atlantic okay. salmon. In the Pacific uh, genus, which is Ocorhynchus, there are seven. Okay. Uh, now, this tells us something interesting about the Atlantic and the Pacific. It means that the Pacific has more varieties of environmental opportunity than the Atlantic. The Atlantic puts out this one species, and, and all over the North Atlantic, they find places uh, to live. Whereas in the Pacific, they find different situations and adopt them differently, and so develop different species. The thing about salmon is that they're extremely adaptable. Mm. Even in the same species in two different rivers, even rivers next to each other, have completely different DNA, DNA that is more different than yours and mine. Wow. Uh, not that I've checked out your DNA. But <laughs> 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 um, they, uh, this, this is one of the abilities they have to survive, is this ability to adapt to whatever situation they're in. So uh, a salmon that lives in a river that has waterfalls is a great jumper. Mm -hmm. it, it's a salmon with uh, uh, strong currents and a long river is a much stronger uh, fish, um, which is why from the commercial point of view, the salmon that are most sought after are the salmon from great rivers because they had to have great characteristics to make it up the river, so Copper River, Columbia, places like that. Um, small rivers develop um, uh, smaller, less imposing salmon, but a salmon can jump 10, 11 feet in the air. Wow. I mean, they're just That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. And there's places where you can watch it. I remember there's this one waterfall in Scotland, in the Highlands, where uh, it's very easy to see them. You just watch salmon after salmon leaping up this waterfall and yeah. clearing the top. Or sometimes they don't clear the top and then they fall down to the rock below and they kind of shake it off and go again. <laughs> they're unstoppable. Salmon will yeah. not quit. Uh, which is what's tragic about dams that they can't get over. They will just keep trying and trying. And that that was the next question I was going to ask is like, what happens when when a dam is placed in a river or other changes like deforestation? How does that impact their ability to um, survive in these river environments? Or well, travel? A, a, uh, a successful salmon river needs forested banks. Mm -hmm. uh, the trees on the bank keep the river uh, relatively narrow and deep. Um, you, you can see this in a river like the River Dee in, in, in Scotland, where there's a forested part that is very uh, narrow and deep, and then there's a deforested part, completely deforested for the shooting of grouse. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have trouble understanding. But anyway, you know, they've cleared this land for grouse. And it's beautiful. It's it, it's you know this is the famous Highland look. You know of these bald mountains with purple beautiful. heather on them. What One of my favorite looking? places on earth. I love I love that region of Scotland. Yeah, it's so beautiful. But what you're looking at is actually deforestation. Oh, <laughs> well. Uh, you need you need the forest to hold the river together. You also need the forest because there are nutrients in the trees that fall in the river. And you also need the forest because uh, salmon need the shade. Salmon um, can't live or reproduce in water that is warmer than 68 degrees. So if the sun is really uh, burning down on it, they have a better chance of survival if they have shaded places they can go to. Wow. Yeah. So how do biologists track the success of salmon? And, you know, and I know that biologists track them for the purpose also of informing commercial fishermen when they can actually catch um, salmon. Right. Actually, salmon are an unusually manageable commercial species. If mm -hmm. you catch them uh, in the river or by the river, you know, in the, in the ocean just in front of the river, if you, if you catch them at sea, which is not allowed anymore. That's a problem because mm -hmm. catching salmon at sea, you have no idea 
what river they belong to. So you have no way of evaluating how that stock is doing. But uh, rivers, they can use either spotter airplanes or spotting towers or sometimes radar. But I mean, I've done this and you, you can really see it. You see the fish swimming up the river, little black streaks, and, and you can count them. And mm -hmm. when you counted enough, so that the stock has enough spawning uh, stock so that they can come out of this year as well as they came out of last year. Then you radio the fishing fleets that are offshore and tell them, okay, you can fish for the next 12 hours or the next 18 hours. Um, and the fishermen wait for these, uh, they're called openers. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done this kind of fishing and it's, you know, you get an 18 hour opener and you're exhausted. Is it just not? Is it just nonstop work with the crew yeah. during those hours? Okay. You're just you're just hauling nets for 18 hours. And you don't want to waste the second of it. Uh, and uh, it's you know once the once the opener is over, you got to wait. You know, and it might be a week, it might be a few weeks before there's another opener, uh, depending on how much the salmon are coming back. But you can't let the fishermen catch more than uh, our balance with the stock that's reproducing in the river. Yeah, and you explain this so well in the book too. If you have a stable stock, the population can can go on and you can have sustainable fishing. Um, I guess the danger then is- What yeah. sustainable is, you know, I, over the years, I get this question a lot, especially from kids. It's what are we gonna do if we eat up all the sustainable fish? <laughs> you know, the whole point <laughs> of sustainable fish, what it means is these are fish that that are, are are reproducing they're sustaining their population mm -hmm. uh, so that this can go on forever as long as it stays sustainable yeah well how how do wild caught salmon differ from farm reared salmon and uh, what how are salmon reared in a farm setting it just seems a strange place for a fish that spends so much time at sea and the river um, how how are they how are they farmed? Well, you know, don't you think ranches are strange places for yeah <laughs> animals to be raised that should be out in the forest or on a plains or something? It's it's the it's the same kind of thing. Um, uh, salmon that are that are farmed are basically genetically selected. Uh, you know, there's no natural selection. This is, mm -hmm. this is true of, you know, cows and goats and everything, you know, yeah. and, you know, people, to, they, they talk about not giving livestock, including salmon, genetically modified food. They are genetically modified food. Yeah, yeah, by nature, <laughs> yeah. Things have been completely modified. And in the case of salmon, they have been modified for just one thing, to be fast growing. Mm -hmm. And that's all a salmon can do. It's just this stupid, fast-growing animal. And that's why it's so dangerous when they escape if they crossbreed with wild salmon. Now, oh. you can only, it's a hard, fast rule in biology that, that, that you cannot crossbreed outside of your genus. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why you don't have dog cats or things yeah. like that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, and so most, not all, but most of the farmed salmon are Atlantic salmon. Even the salmon that are farmed in the Pacific are Atlantic salmon. I don't know why. It's what they started on first, and I guess it's where they developed the farming species they liked. When a farmed Atlantic salmon escapes in the Pacific, people get very excited and upset. But the truth is they're not going to interbreed with wild salmon because they're the wrong genus. Yeah. Um, all they could do is set up their own colony, and that colony probably couldn't survive. It couldn't. It couldn't compete with the wild colonies, because you know the whole point of what we've been saying is that these are inferior fish. You know, so they can't compete. They tend to die off. But in the Atlantic, when they escape, they can cross with wild Atlantic salmon. And they create a wild Atlantic salmon that has less of the wild attributes. Okay. You know, it's like, you know, my my father can change his skin and leap 11 feet in the air. 
and my mother can just grow fast. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, so like, that that is a great danger. Um, now, as, as far as there, the difference gastronomically between wild and, and uh, farmed salmon, this is to me a very interesting thing because I see something happening that happened with meat. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, wild, a wild salmon is much leaner and much stronger tasting, yeah. uh, which I think is great. I mean, a wild sockeye or a wild king, wild Atlantic, if you ever get one, which you know, so I've only eaten a wild Atlantic once in my life, because uh, there's no more commercial fishing of Atlantic salmon. Okay. Um, but this is a, a gastronomically an incredible treat. Um, farm salmon are, uh, the meat is very fatty and very mild. So you know what happens? People get to like fat, mild salmon. It's, it's what happened with beef. Yeah. Well, a mm -hmm. lot of people don't like game. Uh, they think it's too strong tasting, which they call gamey. What do you want from game? <laughs> and, it, and it's very lean. Um, they want it grained with fat and mild tasting. Um, and the same thing is happening with people's taste for salmon. Yeah. And they, I think also the food that farmed salmon um, eat, is it, are they also on a corn-based diet like we have with, with cattle? Uh, well, this is a very complicated question. Now, mm -hmm. when my cod book came out, I was flat out opposed to um, farmed salmon. Mm -hmm. The reason for that was it didn't make any sense because they were being fed wild fish um, from the worst kind of factory trawlers, scooping up all this stuff and grinding it up. Mm -hmm. And so that if you ate a farm salmon, you, you, more wild salmon had died than if you just ate a wild salmon. Um, now, the thing I have to say about... Um, Fish farmers, by and large, um, most of the ones that I've talked to have been Norwegian, although not only in Norway. <laughs> I mean, the <laughs> Scottish farms are all Norwegian owned, and many of the Canadian ones are Norwegian owned. And um, these people, you know, Scandinavians don't make very good villains. You know? <laughs> and so they, they realize that there are all sorts of environmental problems with farmed salmon. And they hate this because the original idea was this was supposed to be a great environmental idea. It was supposed to be sustainable, low cost protein from mm -hmm. part, parts of the ocean that weren't being used for anything. Uh, great idea. And it turns out it's not, but there's environmental problems. So, you know, they're trying to deal with these problems. And one of those problems is what do they eat? Mm -hmm. And they've reduced the amount of, of fish that they eat. And they eat, um, uh, eat a lot of soy. Soy, uh, okay. Interesting. GMO free soy, so they can sell it in Europe. Mm. And um, Soy that's probably grown in the Amazon, leading to deforestation there. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's, it's all, like it's all connected. Yeah. So it's like, you know. I mean, one, one thing you learn if you really work with environmental issues is that no matter what you do, you're bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and there there's all sorts of experiments with coming up with new kinds of proteins with a mm -hmm. um, black soldier fly and things. Um, so they're, they're trying to solve that problem. Right now, they're only about half wild fish, but their customers, turns out, prefer it. The more wild fish you feed them, the better they like the farmed salmon. Huh. So uh, the French in particular want wild fed farmed salmon to as good an extent as they can. The British want, want environmentally conscious low fish content to their wild salmon. Or <laughs> as, a, as a Scottish fish farmer, farmer said to me, you know, the, 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 the British are about good practices and the French are about good food. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a difficult problem. One of many difficult problems about fish farming. Uh, they draw sea lice. Sea lice is this 
crustacean that uh, feeds on salmon. And you get like one or two out of salmon. So that, you know, fishermen know this, but if you're fishing in a river and you catch a salmon and it's got a lice or two on it, that's great because lice die in fresh water. So if they still have lice on it, it means that they've come from the ocean fairly recently. So if you think back to what I was saying about their life cycle, Mm -hmm. the closer they are to their ocean life, the higher quality the fish is. Yeah. The problem is that if you have a farm, uh, you might have a million or more salmon. So, you know, I mean, I mean what happens, uh, you know, it, it, it's like if you leave out enough food, you're going to get a lot of ants. You know? Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if you have millions of salmon there, you're going to attract a huge amount of lice. And of course, they will also go on to the wild fish that are in the area so that wild salmon that are anywhere near fish farms are plagued by uh, the slice and um so this is a huge problem the yeah. estates are a huge problem um you know that um attempts to keep them disease free with various antibiotics and things are uncertain yeah. problems. We don't really know about this stuff, but we know we know we're getting too many antibiotics in our foods. So. Our foods, absolutely. Well, and what I'm gathering from this too is are are the are the farm salmon re reared in salt water their full life cycle, or do they also have a period where they expose them to fresh water before harvest? That's all. Completely. <laughs> Salt water, which is why they don't lose their lice. Okay. So they came up with this thing. They, they came up with wrasse, a fish that eats sea lice. And so they put wrasse in the pens with them to eat the lice, but they can't uh -huh. keep up with it. So they started to overfish the wrasse. So, <laughs> you know, these guys, you know, they know how to deal with overfishing. They start farming the wrasse, and they now farm wrasse to eat the lice. Eat the lice. <laughs> uh, but it's not really a complete problem they can't they can't handle all the yeah uh, they're doing so you know then my feeling about fish farming i i i've evolved on this um i don't want to see it stop i don't want to see it banned uh because it does something useful it's, we need the protein it, it produces mm -hmm. uh good good protein it's not taking up land it's uh, which is becoming more and more of an issue absolutely uh, so it's something they need to fix. They should do it, but they need to fix it. And I, I think this is a great lesson in environmentalism. I think that we environmentalists have too much of a tendency to demand the banning of things, where we should be demanding the fixing of things. Say, okay, you can do this, but you have to do it right. Mm -hmm. um, the CEO of... Uh, Green Harvest, which is the largest uh, salmon farmer in Scotland, a Norwegian, mm -hmm. uh, he said to me, you know, I talk to environmentalists all the time. It's good to talk over problems. And, and I know that he does because I know environmentalists who talk to him. He says, the only thing is, if I get somebody who says fish farming should be banned, then we don't have anything to talk about. Yeah. And yeah. It's an important lesson there. Yeah. Is, is working on solving the problems, not just, yeah, trying to erase it. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that I've noted in your in your writing is, you know, you, you and you've mentioned this over the conversation, is you've, you've met a lot of people that are involved in salmon fishing, either wild caught salmon or farmed. And I mean, this opportunity to travel and meet so many interesting characters um, must be one of the, the great things you love about your work. It is. It's, yeah. It makes my job great. I mean, I love going around and meeting all these people and talking to them and the variety of people. Yeah. Uh, I particularly love meeting fishermen. Mm -hmm. And I love um, getting kind of old for this, but I'm still doing it. I love uh, working on commercial fishing boats. I, I, I worked uh, as a kid on commercial fishing boats, and I love it. So I still... You know, when I get a chance, I went out. It's in the book. I went out with a couple of uh, yeah uh, gill netters in, in Alaska and, and, and had a great time. And what you know, one of them said that she she loved taking me out because I just seemed so happy out there. 
That's great. And you also share some of their of their recipes, which I loved. Do you have any favorite recipes for salmon that you've learned about during your travels? Well, um, uh, Thea Thompson's uh, uh, salmon chowder, which she mm. served in a cold night in the Gulf of Maine was, you know, I guess the, the situation enhanced the food, but it's a great it's a great dish. Um, uh, there, there's quite a number of, uh, of great dishes. Personally, my favorite way to cook a salmon is to throw a little salt on it and grill it. Um, just grill mm. it, skin bubbles up. Yeah. And that's it. No sauce, nothing. Just enjoy the wild taste. That's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, there's there's such incredibly flavorful fish, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, if I had a farm fish, you know, I might do a sauce or something with it. But if it's wild, just just grill it. You know, it's like it's like oysters. You know, so New Orleans have all these elaborate recipes with oysters. It's fine. There's, New Orleans oysters don't have any taste anyway, but if you get really good, really good northern oysters, you don't want to put a lot on them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just make that. people in New Orleans mad. <laughs> so um, wrapping up, I guess I wanted to dive a little bit more into this link between the health of the planet and the health of salmon. And you draw a really beautiful tie between this and the book. What? What are some of the major points that you'd like people to know and um, any other pieces of information about the book that you'd like to share? Well, the first thing you need to know is that if you want to understand about how our planet is being destroyed by climate change, just look at salmon. Mm -hmm. uh, you could look at other fish too. Um, so salmon, as I said, can only live in water up to 68 degrees. Uh, so you had a situation in Alaska. Uh, I haven't checked out how they're doing this summer, but last summer was a very hot summer. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked this out because the summer is so weird, you know. <laughs> it's like yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they had a very hot summer last summer, and they had, you know, very good salmon runs coming into the river, but a lot of them died without spawning because the water was too warm. Oh wow! That's climate change. Yeah. Uh, another thing that climate change does is it puts fish in places where they're not supposed to be. So you have striped bass way, way, way north in Canada going into, because they're an anadromous fish also, going into salmon rivers and eating the young pars, which didn't used to happen because they didn't go that far north. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the big thing that's happening is that you find, particularly in the, in the Atlantic, but all over, that salmon spawn in the rivers, they have a, a, a stock of, of young, small fish. The fish make it out to sea, and they don't make it back. Fewer, fewer of them make it back. And what, what, what is happening is um, carbon emissions. Um, carbon emissions are changing the um, uh, the, the food makeup of the ocean so that uh, um, things like zooplankton and little feed fish like capelin aren't getting enough to eat mm -hmm. and they aren't growing big enough so that salmon and also by the way cod and a whole bunch of other fish yeah. um, are just not getting the food they need to survive. Uh, this, this is the scariest thing I've ever learned. I mean, just just think about what I'm saying, that the Atlantic Ocean no longer has the carrying capacity to feed the animals that live there. That's incredible. It's And it's happening so quickly. I mean, over the past few centuries, there's certainly been an acceleration, but now in this century, it's, it's sped up so quickly. If, if we're going to survive, we have to do something about it. Yeah. Of course, here comes the commercial. The first thing we have to do about it is get rid of Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone should vote. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, you actually have a chance this year to vote for the survival of the planet. Yeah. 
we need we need better environmental policies in the U.S. and abroad, and we need to make smarter decisions as consumers as well. Just like every vote counts, every purchasing choice you make counts. Well, because we start thinking about this whole climate mm -hmm. change thing, which is why certain politicians are, you know, working on denial. Denial is very appealing because otherwise, you know, you have to do something. I mean, think about it. If you live in Indiana, mm -hmm. I know and like Indiana, so I'm picking on them. <laughs> uh, if, if you live in Indiana and you have a big gas guzzling SUV, guess what? You're killing fish. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah. Just, we really have to change the way we do things. I think right now is a really unique point in history, too, because of you know, of COVID, life across the planet has changed in some ways. We don't, we're not using as many fossil fuels because people are staying more in place. So I think for climate scientists, it's, it's a unique opportunity to see what a shutdown can do it, in terms it, of it, if it's even possible it, to make a positive change. And, and, and the great lesson I keep thinking about is that, that, by and large, I mean, there's people who want to refuse to wear masks and die, but by and large, people are on the program. They're, 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 mm -hmm. they're shut things down and they're doing what they have to do to make this work. Yeah. And I think, why can't we get them to be that way about climate change? I think it's, it, it's a, climate change is such a, it's a hard concept, I think, for many people to wrap their heads around if I could simplify it in one way, it would be that it would be about nature and balance. And when you have an imbalance in nature, you have issues like diseases that come out of the forest and race across the globe. You have the loss of our, you know, of our stability in our food system. There's, we have to find that balance again. Correct. You say to people, if you don't do what you need to do about mm -hmm. this pandemic, you know, a hundred thousand people are going to die in this town. Yeah. People react to that. But yeah. Say, you know, if you don't do what you have to do about climate change, you know, your children in thirty years are going to be in a lot of trouble. To abstract. Yeah. Oh. Well, I want to end things on a happier note. <laughs> so, <laughs> and just say that we have, we do have challenges. I think the the biggest thing people can do, the listeners to the show, what I would encourage you to do is to read more, learn more about the issues, take individual actions in the voting booth, take individual actions in your purchasing decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really the only way we can move forward right now is, you know, educate ourselves and each other about these issues. Being done and what can be done. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, Mark, do you have any future pro uh, projects kind of in the works? I, like I said, I'm a big fan of your writing. That you, can you I, give us any teasers? I have a book coming out next March about okay. the history, literature, and culture of fly fishing. Oh, nice. Okay. It's all about fly fishing and why we fly fish and why we have and who has and who started it and what the evolution of this equipment is and you know because if you think about it it's a weird thing to do certainly not a good way to catch fish you know? yeah. <laughs> but uh, it looks beautiful <laughs> and fun yeah. uh, so that's uh that that's that one and then and then uh a year after that the following january i have a very unusual book coming out it's called the importance of not being earnest. And it's a, it's a kind of a memoir. It's about how in my life, I keep ending up in places where Ernest Hemingway was famous. <laughs> and so I've spent my life dealing with Hemingway fans. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's great. And so it's about the whole Hemingway legend and, and its impact. It's great. I've, I've visited his house on uh, Key West. It's quite a place to see, yeah. Yeah, that's a strange one because, uh, you know, I, I've talked to uh, his only surviving son who went there and said, wow, there's just nothing in this house that we had. 
Uh, <laughs> it's all staged, I guess. <laughs> cats. They didn't have six stone cats. <laughs> uh, and then uh, after that book comes out, I have this other book I'm working on. It's a page turner about the history and culture of onions. Oh, actually, I may have to follow back up with you about that one because, you know, I love everything about botanicals. So, <laughs> and onions are, have, I'm sure, quite a history. Yeah, they do. And they're, you know, um, they're this unique uh, plant that, you know, it has this defense mechanism where they, they shoot out acid if you cut into them. That's why you cry. <laughs> you cry. But, yeah. Uh, I suppose it was originally to keep mammals from digging them up and chewing them. And, and they're so important in so many cultures. Uh, the, the Indian Indian governments get to the brink of overthrow when onion crops fail. It, it's, it's like a corn yeah. crop in the U.S. Yeah. Um, Amazing. And, you know, there are places, there are onion places, like Vidalia in Georgia, Maui in Hawaii. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you know that Chicago, the word Chicago means onion in a native language because it was an onion field. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Oh, that sounds fascinating. What a great book. The Amazing Allium. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to have fun with that. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Mark. It was great speaking with you. My pleasure talking to you. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. You can find Mark's books, including his latest on salmon at any major bookstore. We have over 50 episodes on the show now available to you online through Apple Podcast or on foodiepharmacology.com. You can also watch videos of the episodes at the Teach Ethnobotany YouTube channel. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time. <laughs>